Okay. We can start now, right? Thank you. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, welcome to this uh, particular session. My name is George Chow, your moderator today. Uh, it is my pleasure to represent Amphore to moderate uh, this uh, session today, which is in collaboration with International Labour Organization. Uh, I am the Director of Asia Pacific on behalf of Amphore based in Hong Kong. Before we start, please join me to give a very warm welcome to our six, five distinguished speakers from four different locations. Um, first of all, uh, Mr. Chris Humphrey, Executive Director of EU RCM Business Council, based in Singapore. Welcome, Chris. Dr. Christina Martinez, specialist, Senior Specialist on Environment and Decent Work and Asia Pacific Coordinator for Green Jobs, Just Transition and Climate Action for Jobs Initiative. She is also part of the ILO Green Jobs Global Team based in Bangkok. Welcome, Christina. Uh, next is uh, our two gentlemen uh, based in Hong Kong, Mr. Brian Ho, partner of Climate Change of Sustainability Services, Ernest and Yang, Dr. Percy Chen, also based in Hong Kong, Quality Director, Group Quality Assurance, GP Batteries International Limited. Last but not least, Mr. Julian Grant, the General Manager of Commercial Operations of Grant Studio, based in Melbourne, Australia. Welcome all of you. Thank you for joining us. Why do we choose uh, this topic today? decent workplace in Asian supply chains? The answer is simple, because going green is not an isolated job. Every tree we plant, every product we make and we consume, every breath we take, affecting each other. Sustainability has been the priority of many countries for decades. Since 2015, this common priority has been articulated in the 17 United Nations Sustainable Development Goals which are committed by over 100 member countries across the world. Among all, seven of them are directly related to going green. That is number six, clean water, seven, clean energy, seven, 11, sustainability, 12, responsible consumption, 12, uh, 13, climate uh, action, 14, life underwater, and 15, life on land. Since then, many governments and business have set up different uh, plans uh, on national level with tangible targets towards the deadline of 2030. All supply chain actors have become the key implementers of national plans. We are all sharing not just responsibility, but also challenges. That's why we have a crossover discussion today uh, involving actors along different uh, roles in our supply chains. We have seen many governments and companies investing a lot to build green supply chains such as the ASEAN Catalytic Green Finance Facility, ACGF. As of February last year, the ACGF's seven co-financing partners have committed $1.42 billion for sovereign loans and over $13 million for technical assistance. Back in 2018, the declarations on promoting green jobs for equity and inclusive growth of ASEAN community made by the ASEAN member states has demonstrated com the commitment of AMS in, co in cooperation to jointly build a decent green workplace in this important regional economic cluster. Despite of multiple funding programs, policies and initiatives have been formulated in the past decades, there are still lots of challenges that business who are due to implement the strategies in their supply chains. So today, without further ado, we have uh, five speakers um, coming from four locations with over a hundred years of experience in sustainability, sustainability in ESG, sharing uh, their, uh, in, their insights uh, on this topic with us. The first one I would like to start to invite Chris, uh, Mr. Chris Humphrey. Uh, Chris, thanks for joining us from Singapore. I know you have been uh, in Asia for long, uh, more than 15 years out of your 30 years a career. So uh, you are the experts and uh, doing all the uh, advocacy work, um, uh, especially focusing on sustainability related free trade agreement between economies like EU and ASEAN. So I would like to start uh, with uh, two questions uh, for the, today's discussion. So what is your council's strategy and service to support your members to, to pursue the UN SDG, especially those related to business environmental requirement in ASEAN countries. Thank you. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me today. Looking forward to a, a discussion on what is a very important topic uh, for many across the world and indeed here in Southeast Asia. 
first of all, I should start off by saying that the EU ASEAN Business Council is a it's a membership body uh, consisting mainly of very large European MNCs. And, and our mission, broadly speaking, is to advocate to improve the trade and investment climate between Europe and Southeast Asia and within Southeast Asia to benefit our members. Um, which involves a lot of collaborative work with other bodies, uh, other business councils, including uh, ASEAN bodies uh, as well. And then as, as part of our work, naturally, I think sustainable development, um, sustainable development in its broadest sense, but economic and social development are, are very key to our members. It's at their hearts. We need to have sustainable development to make sure that the region can progress, can progress in an even handed way. Markets can grow, people can be looked after. Jobs can be secured, health can be looked after, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, I know today we're talking more about the, the greening of the workplace, the greening of supply chains. I would say at the outset there is a bit of um, a feeling that for in this part of the world, many Europeans look at sustainability and they just focus on the green elements of it. Whereas here, of course, um, other parts of the UN SDGs are perceived as being perhaps more important. And, you know, putting food on the table, getting education for your kids, having access to a decent job, access to decent health care for many people in the region uh, would take precedence over green issues. Our view at the Council is those two elements are not mutually exclusive. They can be run together. They need to be run together for the sake of all of us and to have a good and sustainable future going forward. And on that basis, a lot of our advocacy work has been tied in many respects to the UN SDGs, to all 17 of them. Um, so we establish a bunch of uh, what we call advocacy groups, committees, other people might call them, looking at a range of sectoral and cross-sectoral issues. So we have groups that cover things like insurance, sustainable finance, digital healthcare, automotive, and then cross-cutting groups looking at things like trade facilitation work, sustainability and anti illicit trade uh, as well. And you know, the groups are made up mainly of our MNC members. They also include representatives from the European Chambers of Commerce across the region. So we can get a broad and diverse view from industry, both large and small, from the European perspective. And we've done work in a number of areas. In the last uh, 12, 18 months, we've produced papers on driving forward a circular economy in ASEAN that's very directly linked to, to greening supply chains, to improving uh, or reducing wastage and reusing assets and materials. Uh, this year, we're going to do a deeper dive on plastic waste in the region, looking at ways to uh, improve education and uh, improve regulation around the handling of plastic waste and reducing, in particular, single-use plastics. Um, also this year, and that very soon, we'll be publishing a paper on energy transition in Southeast Asia. And that's important. Well, why is that important? It's important for the region because if you look at what the EU is doing with its uh, proposed carbon border adjustment mechanism, if you are making products to export to the EU and you're burning a lot of carbon in the process, uh, you're going to face um, uh, some sort of payment at the border for your products going forward. So moving away from heavy carbon emitting industries uh, or power sources to ones that are using more renewables will be very important to the region. And that paper will look both at the technology and more importantly, perhaps at the financing of that energy transition. And which brings me on to sustainable finance. A lot of work on that. We've been engaging a lot with ASEAN uh, finance ministers and central bank governors on this topic. There is a appetite, I think, in the region for a lot more sustainable financing for infrastructure and indeed for investments from companies. And it's a question of how you manage that and put in place the rights sort of regulations. And then perhaps on a more micro level, um, in the next week or so, we will be publishing a paper around automotive standards in Southeast Asia. And that's going to look at things like improving fuel efficiency and raising emission standards in the automotive industry, um, i.e. reducing pollution, reducing um, the use of petrol and diesel at the same time. And then there is the human development aspect of it. I shouldn't forget that. And we did a paper last year on human development as well in the region. So all about how you can boost your manpower, upskill your manpower, bring along communities together. And with all of these areas, we work with our companies. We lean on what they've been doing, particularly on their CSR work. Um, I think most of our members being Europeans and because the way that Europe is going, we have to be very mindful of legislation that's coming out from the EU 
So whilst we're independent of the EU, we need to be thinking about what they're doing and how it's impacting on our work and our relationship with governments in Southeast Asia and how we can leverage on that to encourage faster progress in the region as well and make sure that our members can then meet their obligations coming out of Europe as well as their obligations to their local communities in which they're working here. So a lot of that is done through, as I said, papers, it's engagement with governments, it's engagement with various ASEAN bodies, and then it's running a series of webinars at the same time across a number of subjects. And one final thing I'd mention is a paper we're going to do later in the year. It's going to focus on agricultural production in Southeast Asia, and it's going to look about how we can work with governments in the region to help alleviate rural poverty, to help improve food nutrition and help them with their own food security at the same time whilst using technologies and systems which will not do harm to the to the environment. So hitting a number of different SDGs in that respect. Uh, very impressive indeed. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Chris. Uh, in fact, uh, yes, uh, green is not just a color. Actually, it's, it should be integrated in the overall sustainability concept. And uh, you have been uh, taking a very holistic uh, approach. And uh, thank you for the commitment of your members. But having said that, you represent the European business community and you do operate in the region which is remote from Europe. So what do you see are the top challenges, say, uh, about this increasing growth of stringent environment, environment environmental requirement or sustainable requirement, not just driven by EU, but as in authorities, I have met, uh, say, government officials in, uh, say, Vietnam or even Thailand and different countries also have their uh, own uh, growing uh, more demanding requirements on this for business operation in the region. So what do you see the impact and uh, in, the, in, the, in, uh, in the business uh, uh, community when they do uh, trade between EU and ASEAN? And uh, how do they manage those challenges in uh, our supply chains? Yeah. Okay. Well, I think there, because there you you mentioned lots of, of the paper you have prepared. Yeah. So, yeah. Go ahead. There are a number of different challenges that are faced in the region. You got to remember, you got countries in the region who are desperately trying to move up the economic development ladder. They need to avoid getting caught in that middle income trap. Um, they are in a race against time because whilst we think the region is actually very young. It is actually aging pretty rapidly as well. Um, so the youngsters today in 10, 15 years time will not be young and they're not having enough children. So there's a demographic dividend at the moment, but it, that window will be closing for many countries as well. So they're in a race against time. They need to develop. Um, they also need to be mindful of what they're doing around them as well for that on the sustainability side of life. I mean, when it comes to things like greening supply chains, Unfortunately, at the moment, a lot of the goals that we'd all love to achieve, and I mean all of us, not just Europeans, people on this call, but industry in the region, governments in the region, are perhaps not achievable in the mo at the current state of time. And that's because some industries are, of course, dependent still on the consumption of raw materials. Um, uh, looking after waste is not particularly high on their priorities, and there's a lot of improvement needs to be on that area. And there are some negative impacts on the environment. Um, and for them, some of the technical, some of the technology solutions um, are not economically viable at the moment. So we need to find a way yeah. of improving the technology and lowering the cost for them and explaining the benefits and moving to things like uh, energy efficiency. You can show the numbers pretty easily. If you change electrical motors in your factory, you're burning less electricity, you're burning therefore less coal at the moment in, in the production cycle. What I would say is that yeah. the region is, is acutely aware of these, these issues now. Brunei, for its chairmanship of ASEAN this year, has put a couple of environmental targets in there. Energy transition is one of them. Uh, sustainability issues mm. feature heavily in ASEAN's comprehensive recovery framework, which they issued last year. Mm. Um, there is an issue around green infrastructure, green technology in the region, available or suitable talent. But I think that will begin to improve. There's a lot of work being done, particularly by European firms and things like energy transition. You're seeing more and more wind farms and solar uh, places coming up, but there needs to be a change of mindset from governments. I mean, building a coal fired power station is easy technology and it's relatively cheap to do. We need to find a way to stop them wanting to do that and provide alternatives. And that's also what the council has been doing on a thing called an energy transition mechanism, which essentially means accelerating the retirement of those power stations. And I think that's important for the region. Again, I mentioned the carbon border adjustment mechanism that the EU is thinking of putting in place. And for the region to make themselves competitive 
um, they should be seeing that as an opportunity to help drive forward more on renewable energies. Um, the other issue is around interoperability of standards, I think, in the region at the moment. Um, there's no, if you're looking at environmental uh, or sustainable financing, there is no one ASEAN taxonomy to try and govern how the rules around that might work. What does count as a green finance opportunity? Um, we know they're working towards it, we're encouraging them to work towards it, but they need to do more in that space. And that will then help unlock a lot of pent up demand and then pent up capacity to provide green financing. Now, whether that is for large scale infrastructure or it's just to help companies invest more to grow their factories, to green their factories, or to help with their supply chain cleaning up, um, doesn't really matter. The, the, the willingness is there, but you need to have the right sort of rules in place to, to match that going forward. And I think that's a very important issue for the region to start thinking more and more about. Yeah, thank you for sharing those insights. And indeed, awareness are already here. They are, however, the uh, the mindset of the government and the different stakeholders should work together too. I hope the carbon border concept it can uh, only be a uh, kind of a little bit push, but not uh, being abused. Otherwise, people people may uh, isolate themselves also. And uh, hope we can see more incentives program uh, coming forward too. And uh, thank you for the uh, good work of the council. We look forward to have more collaborations. So now uh, let's move uh, to another perspective. While we hear all those uh, governmental requirements coming from all sides and the efforts of advocacy to uh, raise our awareness and uh, uh, hasten uh, collaboration, uh, I think down to the earth uh, now, uh, making business happen. We rely on professional minds and uh, expertise and intelligence. So now I would like to invite Brian. I know Brian uh, for nearly 10 years now, and uh, he has been the expert for nearly uh, eight, around 18 years in ESG and sustainability uh, consultancy for many uh, different sectors. So would you like to um, share with us, uh, say an overview of current development of Asian business? How do they respond to UN SDGs requirement? And especially those related to environmental or green supply chains expectations. Sure. Uh, Brian, please. Joyce. Yeah, thanks a lot, Joyce. Uh, so, um, yeah, actually, it's just, I, I'm, I'm really seeing a shift in terms of the um, business perceptions and response to sustainable, sustainability and also uh, align with their strategies to the UN SDGs in the last couple of years. Um, it's, it's really, it's really uh, encouraging. Uh, and I think there's a couple of reasons why uh, uh, behind and also how companies are responding uh, to the UN SDGs. On one hand, we are seeing more and more uh, companies in, in different sectors uh, that they are the leaders and they, they are catching the, uh, catching the eyes or, or of different stakeholders that they are, they are aligning their sustainability strategies to the UN SDG, different, different type of goals. And I believe that the expectations from the stakeholders change a lot and it creates some kind of a more motivation for business to look to, to, to catch up with the trend. For example, uh, Chris mentioned a lot on regarding the regulators, uh, no matter from different different um, countries' perspective. Uh, going green is a, is a really important and strategic topic. For example, like I've, I've been working with uh, uh, Chinese companies in the, in, the, in the last 18 years. And, uh, and I, I, I think the Chinese, gov the, the Chinese government has a very clear uh, national goals on the uh, carbon neutrality. And we are seeing there are more and more companies thinking about how to have a carbon reduction. And especially for companies who are listed in different stock exchanges, uh, we are also we are also seeing that uh, different uh, exchanges or regulators they are requiring companies, listed companies, to disclose and um, put more focus on 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 sustainability as well. For example, the Hong Kong Stock Exchange, they are they have upgraded the ESG reporting guide last year and put quite a lot of focus on. Um, requesting companies to set up environmental management targets and also how they manage their supply chain in terms of, in terms of the environmental and um, social risk management. So I believe that the the, the proactiveness of the regulate from the regulator's perspective create motivation for Asian business to react to this uh, trend. But of course, in other and other really important. Um, Kind kind of uh, 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 motivations comes from the capital market. 
especially international investors due to different uh, new regulations coming out, like the EU sustainable finance and social requirement uh, regulations, or other other types of asset owners that uh, they request the asset managers when they do investment data to look at the company's um, sustainability performance. And we are seeing that uh, many many global big scale asset managers they are, they are putting more and more focus, having more requests on the on their investees capacity in terms of uh, tackling climate change and also going green so um they line up together and also also uh, create some kind of pressures or motivations for info for their for the companies to to think about how to respond to the expectation the emerging expectations of those investors and of course the i, I believe that the the in, ter in terms of the consumer expectations, there's, there's also a change as well, especially uh, how the gen set expectation on corporate, uh, greener product, greener workplace. Also, I, I believe this is all the um, expectations from stakeholders that which uh, those um, Asian business become more and more proactively aligning their strategy to the UN SDGs. But of course, I am. Um, in, in 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 the in the last couple of years, when we when we talk to the companies management, especially the board of directors of the top management of the companies, they start to recognize the business case for uh, for for working on sustainability. In the past, most of the companies you see sustainability is more like a brand building. I mean, how how to create a, a better uh, kind of a marketing or PR campaign. But somehow I, 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 I can I can rec I, I can see that there's a change in their mindset in terms of by doing good on sustainability, there are good business case for doing so, especially no matter from the uh, risk or opportunity perspective. Uh, when we talk about the Asian business, I think mean, I think it's in it's in it's an uh, area that are being impacted by different types of uh, climate change uh, situations. I mean, extreme weather, the more frequency of typhoon. This kind of uh, climate risk bring bring um, different impact to companies' operations. And the management recognize that no matter in terms of the in terms of the uh, valuation of their asset, or even because due to this kind of a uh, uh, physical risk, there may be shift in terms of the regulations. Uh, in the in the future, maybe there will be increasing the energy costs. Or for example, in some in some country like in Singapore, there are already some carbon tax being implemented. So in, in, in such case, I believe that they recognize that if they are not doing good on that, there will be risk. But of course, there are also opportunities as well. As, as mentioned by Chris, I mean, uh, sustainable finance is a really hot topic in the region as well. Uh, there are companies that are doing good. I mean, in terms of having having uh, going green initiatives, they can they can issue something like an issue green bond, or if they have good they have good performance on sustainability, they can also talk to the bank on the sustainability link loan. So that's why I believe that uh, the recognitions of the business case by the companies management in Asia is also a big, uh, is also a big shift. Uh, why this the mindset, the mindset towards uh, sustainability changed a lot in the last couple of years. Thank you. Thank you for uh, sharing with us uh, the latest trend and also uh, those uh, uh, forthcoming big topics. Uh, but uh, it's always easier for the big companies. Uh, I know you lead a team of uh, 60 people uh, serving different companies of all size. So uh, what, do, what are the top challenges uh, you see um, uh, in, say, maybe some particular industry you can call as an example? And uh, how do you support mm -hmm. them to overcome those uh, challenges? Yeah. Yes, uh, I think there are a couple couples um, biggest challenges that we are seeing. First is a kind of a transformation because as mentioned in the past, when companies think about sustainability, it may be something like uh, publishing a sustainability report or doing some kind of a PR campaign, which sustainability may lie on a specific function on, for, for example, like marketing or corporate communication. But now, when we talk about sustainability, it's about management. It's about how to create a comprehensive management system. We have structure, we have policy, we have procedures to manage different sustainability issues. So how to, how to, how to make this transformation from a disclosure-based 
uh, initiative to a more internal control based management system is something that we are seeing that Asian companies have difficulty on, difficulties on because when we talk about creating a management system, uh, we need to think about the collaboration between different departments and also how the kind of a company's top management, they have a top down approach to make uh, sustainability become the KPI of different departments and make it make it happen within an organization. So I think I think the first biggest challenge is in terms of the men, how to do this kind of a transformation in management system. The second challenge is regarding the technological innovation and also the return on investment, because when we talk about going green, uh, especially in different in, in some industry, there may be some limitation. I mean, more better in the manufacturing, uh, where, how, how to make the cost being justified that they change all the production line, change all the equipment, or in some industry, like the, in the real estate sector, they have been already doing quite a lot on, on energy saving or, 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 or emission reduction. But in terms of how to make those technological innovation happen, companies need to think about the, uh, the return on investment, but not, uh, in a, not in a short term, but in a longer term. So how to make sure that top management can have such mindset or they can, they, they can, they can, they can recognize that the ROI should be is okay for them in longer term. I think this is, this is the challenge that our companies need to tackle. I think the third one will be will be an, a really challenging uh, really challenging issue is regarding the lacking of the uh, talent or practitioners regarding sustainability within companies. Because as mentioned in the past, in sustainability silo from the business operation silo from the strategy, these companies only only doing some report or initiate is okay. But now when we talk about the integration, how those practitioners, they both understand sustainability, but also business. It is really, really challenging. It is also some, some challenge that we are facing in, in recruiting people to provide services or even come when companies hire some in-house professionals on sustainability. This is also very challenging because if, they, if the practitioners only talk about sustainability, but not the business case, they can't get the top management buy in, which make everything become slower, or they can they can they can they can get, get the resources to to have such implementation. So I believe I believe that these are the three major challenges I'm seeing in terms of uh, Asian business uh, pursuing those environmental targets, no matter by different stakeholders. Thank you. And uh, so I will uh, save it. Uh, how do you uh, support them in the second round of the question? I am uh, <laughs> very mindful about the time. So uh, save, uh, I will reserve that answer uh, uh, in the second round. So uh, uh, let's move on. Thank you, Brian. And uh, I think it's important say uh, from disclosure to integrated management and uh, how to make it happen is a long way uh, for many uh, um, uh, business to go. And uh, thank you for sharing that. And last, let's move on to Percy. Percy, I know you have uh, many years of experience in quality management and uh, and uh, have been leading your team for many years uh, at a GP. So uh, I know your business has win, uh, won a lot of awards in environmental protection and, and also in CSR side. So um, can you share with us your sustainability uh, or, or say a green production uh, strategy regarding uh, this aspect? Uh, and uh, what's the tips uh, why, why you can win so many awards? <laughs> Thank you. Uh, you are muted. Please unmute. Uh, Percy, please unmute. Thank you. Uh, first of all, thanks a lot for Joyce uh, and also thanks a lot for the organization. Uh, yeah, uh, according to our company, uh, we have a, a long uh, history uh, in the quality side. But according to the sustainability, of course, uh, it is uh, relatively uh, new to the company. Uh, we established our sustainability steering committee uh, through the uh, leadership by our president. And then uh, to drive uh, the sustainability journey, uh, we are looking for the upcoming 10 years. So uh, once we have formed up our uh, steering committee in the sustainability area, uh, our strategy was mainly is uh, based on our companies for the uh, UN Sustainability Development Goal, uh, that is uh, the SDG. 
and also with uh, the save the pen net spirit. So this is our ultimate goal. According to this ultimate goal, uh, our company focused on uh, six areas because uh, according to the resources, we understand we are not possible to cover uh, many of it. According to particularity, this uh, six area, uh, the first one is uh, the uh, community uh, partnership, second one is the employee wellness, and the third one is uh, particularly on the op uh, operational uh, safety and uh, health, and also uh, environmental stability, uh, product innovation, and also uh, responsible business. In particular, uh, we refer back to uh, Joy's question, the sustainability circularity, uh, we uh, focus on all the factory to be validated by a third party. Uh, as an independent party, to uh, especially on zero waste to landfill. So zero waste to landfill is a way to help us uh, to change the mindset of the factory people in order to understand uh, how they can prevent and also make a better environmental consideration. So in that sense, uh, we have the mission and we already done already, uh, the factory in uh, Wilhelm, the factory in Malaysia, and also the factory in China, they all got the uh, award about the uh, silver award by third party validation. Uh, of course, even some uh, better performance factory even got the gold award. For the product innovation area, we also intentionally uh, uh, develop uh, eight model. That is uh, under the what we call the ECV. Uh, that is uh, environmental claim validation. Again, those models are also to be uh, validated by the third party uh, according to some uh, requirement and recycling standard. So that is also uh, show our commitment on uh, product innovation uh, in concerning about sustainability as well. So. Uh, for responsible pieces, uh, just similar to what Brian mentioned, uh, we documented uh, our practice and we documented uh, all our supply chain documents. Uh, like the case of uh, uh, supply chain of uh, sustainability procurement and also the uh, requirement about the governance, uh, we also documented to our supplier and even the framework agreement with the supplier, all the green terms and so on. Uh, my company is uh, focusing on the actual practice rather than any uh, greenwashing uh, uh, approach. So uh, that, that is uh, more in the practical side. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, I think uh, uh, some of the answers actually echo very well to what um, the trend are described by uh, Chris and also uh, Brian. So you are the actual implement. Uh, implementer of uh, all those uh, grain strategy and policy. So um, I would like to know uh, how do you communicate this uh, strategy while well, you have your own steering committee very well managed inside your organization, but you have your supply chain partners, they're coming from different countries and even your team have different cultures. So how do you communicate those policy and um, do you see uh, to provide any support or solutions uh, so that uh, to make sure those who cannot perform uh, also uh, fulfill your requirement? I, I make uh, combine yeah. the second and third questions together. Yeah. <laughs> no problem. That, that, that's okay. Uh, actually, according to the uh, company, uh, we are focusing a lot is uh, on how to make our supply chain and also our factory uh, to uh, really can uh, tackle and uh, go through those uh, difficulty. Uh, we work uh, with our supplier in enhancing uh, that their environmental and also the social performance, uh, especially and go green and also our sourcing uh, supply chain and also the logistic element as well. So according to those uh, 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 requirements, we need to link to our business planning. So uh, my company is uh, trying to uh, group the uh, sustainability requirement into our business plan together. Then we can proceed in a better way. Uh, and also, we embrace the feedback from our stakeholder, uh, of course, including customer, including our supplier, and uh, so on, to help us continuously improve uh, our sustainability target and plans and action, and also contributing to a better world for a future generation with all the effort. So uh, we are aiming to uh, become the role model amongst our batteries industry for uh, preserving the sustainable uh, planet for everyone. So we communicate with our stakeholder through our company website, uh, also our company portal, suppliers survey, 
uh, purchasing uh, agreement, as uh, I mentioned before, and even supplier audit uh, with uh, EHS and also CSRO checklist. Uh, we have the item specialist on those areas as well. And also our auditor also well trained with those requirements. Uh, since uh, human resources uh, is uh, one of the big limitations, we only have only one uh, EHS or CSR officer in each plant and uh, among our close to 10 plants uh, all over the Asian area. And also uh, travel limitation now due to the COVID-19. Also all those are the uh, hazards to our or obstacles uh, to our uh, connection and audit to those uh, suppliers. So what we can do now is uh, trying to uh, have a more uh, virtual audit. Actually, virtual audit in quality side is a lot of new thing. Uh, we base on the virtual audit to help to tackle and try to evaluate our supplier in that area. So finally, according to uh, overcome those uh, challenge, of course, we uh, uh, try to gather with some of the institutions. Uh, like the case of uh, the CSR mark, uh, like the ISO 26000 requirement, uh, we go work together with uh, HKQAA, and also we also work with a uh, BSCI, and also work with uh, some other uh, institution, uh, provide some certain consultancy support, and also we attend a lot of seminar uh, to gain those uh, knowledge and uh, support as well. Thank you yeah, and uh, I, think, uh, I think personally uh, highlight, uh, yeah. Yeah, thank you for uh, sharing all those uh, procedures and practices you have. And uh, I hope uh, business uh, participating today can learn uh, some of the best practices uh, you mentioned. I think you highlight one uh, very important point about human resources challenge. I leave that to uh, Christine. Maybe her sharing will uh, help us comply or support uh, some of the challenges you're facing while you're implementing so many uh, important plans. So uh, let's move ahead because I really want to cover all the questions we have uh, uh, prepared. and so that we can have the best takeaway. So allow me to move on to invite uh, Mr. Julian Grant. Julian, I know you're from Melbourne today. Thank you. You're two hours ahead of us. And I know you are, the work you're doing is also ahead of many small business. Uh, you're running your uh, family business and uh, grand studio. So um, I would like to hear from you because uh, your role is unique in supply chain. Quite often it's quite, uh, allow me to say, many people forgot. Uh, the importance. The, uh, uh, sometimes it's a missing link or actually it's a critical link between suppliers and also the buyers. Would you like to share your company's uh, sustainable global and uh, a sustainable uh, uh, say sourcing strategy regarding environmental requirement? Uh, maybe you can also briefly take the example of your product as uh, um, say uh, the, the demonstration how you uh, implement those uh, strategy. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Thanks Joyce. Yeah. Uh, so just to provide some uh, context to your question, so before I explain uh, our strategies, I'll just explain what it is that we do and the current trends we're finding in our international markets. So our, our business specializes in the product development of custom uh, private label uh, product programs for major retailers in Australia, uh, the UK and the United States. Uh, therefore, as you mentioned, we have an you know, interesting perspective acting as the practical intermediary between uh, our retail clients for whom we develop product and the factories where the goods are made. Uh, so as a result, we've evolved to be uh, adept at transforming, transforming the social and green uh, directives of our retail clients into practical procedures and processes that enable us to uh, deliver on these goals uh, across our own supply chains for them. So talking about the trends, uh, so I'll just clarify, you know, what we're seeing in the marketplace and, and how we're responding. So, I mean, to date, our retail clients, environmental concerns have for the most part uh, been about ensuring that there is no illegal uh, dumping of waste materials, wastewater or chemicals by our producers, directly polluting the local environment or the waterways. Uh, we've also traditionally been uh, focused on providing FSC, so Forest Stewardship Council certification, uh, for any of our paper products or, or packaging, ensuring that they're from sustainable forests. Uh, but what we're now seeing increasingly uh, is a market requirement uh, of our clients around the world in reducing plastic in packaging uh, and the adaptation of more informative recycled package labelling. So one such key initiative uh, that's having had a lot of success in Australia in the last sort of 12 months is the Australasian um, Recycled Labelling Guidelines. 
also known as the ARL. The, the ARL is an initiative of APCO, which is the Australasian uh, Packaging Covenant Organisation. They're a subsidiary of, of Planet Arc, a, a not-for-profit environmental organisation that work closely with private and public sector. Um, but, you know, Australia is not unique and we're seeing very similar uh, labelling initiatives uh, in the UK with Recycle Now and also in the United States with the How to Recycle program. Um, so the aim of these new labelling uh, programs is to improve the efficacy of local curbside recycling programs uh, by providing the public with direct instructions of how to correctly dispose of recycled packaging components. Uh, it's important to I mean, they're all voluntary standards. Um, but how this works is that we're required, therefore, to delve further uh, into our factory's breakdown of our packaging components and, uh, you know, what is their chemical makeup. So we can then work with environmental consultants uh, to determine the appropriate labelling to ensure consumer awareness of how to recycle the items effectively. Uh, so, for example, you know, recycled labelling has been around on packaging for a long time. But um, rather than simply now say that an item is recyclable, uh, we specify which components of the packaging are recyclable uh, and which are not, and what, if any, actions must be taken by the consumer for that component to effectively be processed by the uh, recycling technologies available at curbside by councils. So, for example, you know, you could have a product packaging with a cardboard backing card uh, that may be able to be processed, you know, straight into the recycle bin, uh, but, you know, the plastic wrapping that's around it may need to be scrunched into a ball before it's thrown into the recycle bin uh, in order for the infrared technology in the um, recycling uh, plants to be able to detect it and process it appropriately. So it's about improving, as I said, the, the, the efficiency uh, of uh, the, the recycling technology. So as we are a company which uh, develops private label products under the retailer's own brand, we, you know, we must always conform to the retailer's packaging and branding guidelines. However, we always uh, encourage our customers to adopt these initiatives and we also plan to implement this strategy with our own brands. Um, our procurement strategy is to work only with uh, socially compliant and audited factories uh, that are able to provide the detailed uh, chemical information on their packaging components to assist us in our compliance. Now, they can either obtain this information themselves, or in, some, in most cases, they obtain it from their downstream uh, supply partnerships. Thank you. And, that's our and strategy, uh, in the interest of uh, yeah, thank you. And uh, it's not easy. I, I can see already you have been well trained yourself in, uh, say, articulating all those technical requirements. So um, would you like to share with us how do you uh, communicate those requirements for your, your supply, say, for example, those in China? And uh, what are, are the biggest challenge? Uh, maybe just quote one as an example, and uh, I combine the last question and yeah. how do you support them? Yeah, uh, to make sure they uh, can fulfill uh, your uh, requirement. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, so um, as you mentioned, we currently produce mostly in China and one of the challenges in the past uh, for us and I guess for many Western companies that deal uh, in China is that you primarily deal with the account manager of the factory who uh, you know, tends to be quite fluent in English, but um, you know, the remainder of the state stakeholders within, within the factory organisation uh, may, for instance, only speak Mandarin. Uh, so it makes it difficult to communicate uh, directly with other parts of their organisation. Uh, often that um, account manager tends to be someone with younger generation um, and they're not necessarily necessarily senior within the organisation. And it's quite common that they don't, you know, don't have the authority to deliver on some of these sustainable initiatives. Um, and it can, it can often be a challenge, uh, you know, for them to get your strategies and policies uh, understood by their superiors. Uh, and it's often hard for them to get the, you know, widespread, you know, organisational support and buy-in that they need, um, you know, from their colleagues to make that happen. So we, we strongly believe that communicating clearly in the native language about our strategies and policies is essential to reaching widespread understanding and organisation-wide commitment from our producers. So all of our social policy agreements include side-by-side -side, uh, English and simplified Chinese so that they can be easily circulated uh, across different stakeholders within the factory. 
So we provide, you know, copious written instructions uh, and guidance and simplify Chinese for local suppliers to complete our forms and data collection efforts, including the chemical names of the polymers used in packaging, you know, they're all in Chinese, you know, for example, uh, to ensure uh, accuracy. Um, yeah, so that's that's really the approach that we take uh, in terms of uh, supporting them and making sure that, uh, you know, um, they can perform according to the uh, you know, above mentioned requirements. Um, you know, we take the approach that, you know, any, any factory can perform these tasks as long as they understand what it is they need to do and we're able to support them along the way. Uh, the important thing is getting the right level of cooperation from your producers and encouraging them and being supportive wherever possible. So, of course, you need to have a good relationship built on trust and respect. And if this is present and they can understand the financial benefits to them of uh, being part of the program, uh, then they're happy to be led and uh, given guidance. So we don't typically engage in any you know, third party training or certifications. We've developed their own training systems and they're focused on our specific requirements. Um, we also provide, for example, uh, you know, remote phone support um, and training, whether it be in English or in Mandarin, uh, Chinese, to these factories where further assistance is required. And it's important to note that uh, our translations and our support is not outsourced. So we prefer to have subject matter experts uh, who really understand their uh, area and domain of expertise uh, to do the actual translations themselves so that we can ensure that um, the information is conveyed correctly and appropriately. Thank you. Thank you, uh, uh, Julian. Actually, you point out a very important point and uh, speak the same language is important. It's not just the technical requirement, but whether people can comprehend and uh, uh, down uh, to the operation size. So that built a very a good link to our next uh, uh, speaker, uh, uh, Dr. Christina Martinez, and based in Bangkok. Um, so I owe to me as a facilitator, and you are the um, uh, you giving guidance and support to business uh, how to uh, run a better, a decent uh, workplace. So now uh, down to individuals' protection, and I uh, would like to hear. We all understand the I O has prioritized just transition as uh, this term may be new to many people yeah uh, as one of its main areas of focus in the design and implementation of decent work actions worldwide could you tell us why this topic is so important to the organization and uh, what tools are being implemented to promote this uh, Christina please thank you very much uh, chair and uh, I want to also acknowledge uh, Amphory and the role of Amphory. Um, bringing us together to this discussion. I also benefit from all the panelists uh, before me because the points that you have made uh, show the business, actually, enterprises are also taking the lead. And I think one of our uh, previous colleagues mentioned maybe before the messages were more public relations exercise, let's say, or promotional, but now the things are changing and um, this is very, very encouraging. Um, uh, uh, Joyce also mentioned the ASEAN uh, Green Jobs Declaration and this shows also how such an important group um, of countries and member states in Asia are taking also lead with a declaration that I think uh, will impact also the way uh, business uh, conduct um, the, the, the production uh, of products and services. But let me um, elevate um, or perhaps put another point in this discussion uh, because um, we still, I think, need to emphasize that green goes together with decent jobs. And that link is not always obvious, not always obvious. We just started to understand what greening operations and services um, mean. Um, and doing, making that link is where the just transition um, can um, assist. And just transition is at the core of the ILO's uh, mandate to promote um, decent jobs because 
when we talk about green jobs, it means decent jobs. I would like to make three points. The, the first one is that we must not forget that jobs are a source of dignity. So that means that one workers can have access, and all of us are workers in, in, different, in different positions, can have access to promotions or at a decent salary, but also means that workers, we all have rights to an environment that is free of pollution in the workplace, that is, is uh, free also of extreme heat, and you know uh, how much the heat can impact uh, at the end of our lives, particularly for those occupations in building and construction, for example, but not only, also in the garment sector, for example, uh, it can have a very, uh, very high impact. But when we talk about uh, green jobs uh, as, as the center of the jobs that uh, needs to be in, in produced and enriched and, and promoted, are jobs that are in line with four strategic objectives of the heart at the heart of the decent work agenda. I'm just going to mention these objectives because I think uh, even if uh, the member countries of the United Nations and all the countries represented here have um, aligned to this uh, decent work agenda, it is, it is for a very long time. The ILO has a hundred years, more than a hundred years at this moment of operations, but uh, the four um, um, uh, the four strategic objectives are still very, very valid and even more now. The first one is to set and promote standards and fundamental principles, principles and rights at work. The second one is to create greater opportunities for women and men to decent employment and income. The third one is to enhance the coverage and effectiveness of social protection for all. The fourth one is strengthening tripartite and social dialogue. And uh, when we think about greening operations in, inside businesses, uh, this social dialogue with, uh, with uh, mechanics with workers and employers is of extreme importance for implementation. My second point uh, is that uh, building a green workplace, uh, workplace also needs planning and strategy, and itself it can be a process of just transition. And for what my preview, the preview panelists uh, have mentioned, um, this really has been taken over by the business world, by many of the firms, maybe not all yet, but certainly the firms that are represented here and the organizations are taking this uh, issue seriously enough to invest and to plan and strategize uh, high, from high level uh, in the organization. Greening value chains uh, also will not happen automatically, and I, I was uh, very interested in listening to, to to Julian um, about uh, his role and his company role with um, environmental services and expertise uh, to greening and to provide content to how that effectiveness of green initiatives can be um, take a stage in a definite way. This is very, very uh, encouraging also for the promotion of the services economy in many of the countries in Asia. But as I said, greening value chains will not happen automatically. It will happen by design. And we need to understand this detail. Uh, for example, which occupations are needed uh, for the future of the factories or which ones need green skills upgrading now? And how we ensure workers women, youth, young workers to have the right skills to meet the demand for green production and, and services. As you know, probably more than eight in every 10 workers in the Asia Pacific region are in either low skills occupation or medium skills occupation. 
Many countries in Asia are experiencing, experiencing a surplus of low level skills and business know very well that the skill shortages will continue to increase, particularly for those jobs that require high skilled workers. And uh, these skill shortages already present a major hurdle for the just energy transition, for example, that uh, also um, has been mentioned before. And particularly in certain sectors and occupations, such as wind, wave and tidal power, for example, and for renewable energies, for manufacturing, construction and installation. This is just one example of, of how uh, the uh, just uh, transition planning process needs to touch so many areas and, and the just transition guidelines of the ILO that are available in, in our website touch upon nine areas, nine areas that, that are for governments, uh, for business organizations, for firms, for workers organizations as well. And those areas need this policy coherence to advance uh, together um, for, for achieving this in implementation. I, I think the private sector um, uh, have a very um, a strong role uh, to play by uh, greening and upgrading also the training uh, curriculum inside the firms. You know, the, the firms are doing inductions, are doing training. Um, it, the small firms, the firms from the value chains of industries are reaching out to, to employees, but also to service provider with uh, what we call knowledge intensive service activities. Uh, this is the one by one discussions from management to, to those service providers where the manager, any of you, are already passing on the knowledge, passing on the, the inspiring the ambition for greening operations. So a, a high role that sometimes is not even recorded by the companies. This, this type of um, activities that are very much mentoring the, the business services, uh, employees and, and providers from other firms. So it's, it's spreading out the value chain as well. My third point, and I think that I will finish with this one, is that building a green workplace uh, needs engagement with workers to analyze where greening is needed across production and life cycle of products, but also in relation to behavior inside the firm. And you know, behavior change is one of the most difficult things that uh, any uh, business uh, um, can, can undertake or any organization uh, because the success uh, of implementation and, and of green uh, firms and organizations lies in the coordination mechanism as well on the social dialogue approach to make this structural changes work at the ground level in a transformative way. And um, I think um, when we think about specific tools, that was the one, one, of the, one part of the question from, from Joyce, is um, are, are around in the ILO um, what we call the just transition toolkits for industry sectors. So for example, we are at the moment building one uh, toolkit, just transition toolkit for the garment sector supply chain in Asia. And as part of this toolkit, there are different reports, different um, learning instruments, different explainers that uh, firms and governments can take uh, on board to prepare the just transition plans. We can think the same, and we are doing the same for the energy sector. Um, a just transition uh, toolkit for the energy sector is, is uh, high in the agenda. Um, in many ways, it's easier to understand because we, I think the world understands transition from carbon intensive industries or from mining, uh, coal mining to renewable energies uh, has been uh, already 
uh, well um, researched and explained, and the employment gains are there. But if you think about the garment sector and how are we going to transition the garment sector to environmental sustainability and better ways to, you know, to use uh, the wastewater, the waste into the water in the rivers in Asia, this is another issue. You can also think about the cement industry. What the just transition toolkit for the cement in the cement industry can look like, and they are different, and they need to be adapted also to different countries in Asia because there is no one Asia Pacific. There are many, many, and uh, every country uh, needs this adjustment. Thank you very much. Thank you, Christina, for sharing uh, such a detail. And also, I think uh, now everybody has a homework to do. Uh, go back and then access that uh, just a transition toolkit. Uh, that's the homework uh, we will assign to all of you. And uh, thank you. And uh, it, you bring up a very interesting point. I talked to some manufacturers lately. They run factories, say, in Cambodia, Myanmar. And when they receive a green requirement from the buyers, and they, they just uh, put a section of the uh, production line, said this is the green production line and then finish and then it will back to normal. So this is not a real transition, honestly. So uh, it is a very interesting to know. And thank you for bringing uh, this uh, our topic to uh, with a very heavy uh, elements of our uh, human resources. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm very cautious about the timing. We are supposed to finish in uh, 29 minutes, but we still have one more round uh, to go. Uh, I would uh, uh, kindly re um, remind each of you the next round, uh, the second round of the questions, please make it two minutes. Uh, to answer so that we can allow some uh, open questions. Yeah, if uh, uh, I hope I can have this liberty being the moderator to monitor the timing, uh, if you don't mind, or at least at most maximum three minutes to answer the second round of the questions. So without further ado, may I invite Chris now back to you. And uh, I think uh, you have uh, done lots of uh, good paper. And uh, I also have the pleasure to join um, uh, your uh, many of different webinars. So would you like to uh, highlight uh, your one or two major recommendations you, uh, your council uh, have uh, been trying to do or say you mentioned a lot already, but I would like to hear from your recommendation. How can um, say if you like the ASEAN governments or some business stakeholders uh, work with your members uh, can do a better job together so that uh, they can remain competitive together, not just one-sided. So do you have any recommendations to um, to the stakeholders or in, in this uh, uh, big economic diverse uh, cluster? Yeah. That's a big question. It's a big question. It's a big question. Because you're a big boss. I'll, I'll... <laughs> Thank you. I think I'll try and take the, the, the bigger macro helicopter view of, of this. Um, the root cause of the problem really comes down to where are where is industry, whether it manufacturing or service industry, is getting perhaps the, the biggest uh, non-greening issues from, and that is really from their power supply. Um, so I think what we need to do is get a bit of a mindset change from governments in the region. They need to be thinking more about the longer term and how to increase the amount of a lower carbon emitting fossil fuel usage in their power systems and they're moving increasingly more towards renewables in their power systems as well that's a big ask because as economies of developer calls to demand for for energy goes up but it's, it's going to be a necessity uh, and increasingly i think other countries in the world as i already mentioned with europe will be looking for lower carbon uh, usage in products they're importing into their countries or regions so asean needs to bite the bullet on this and the root cause problem for them in not doing so at the moment really comes down to financing. As governments, they don't have the money to finance the move towards renewables or lower carbon emitting fossil fuel usage. Um, their budgets at the moment because of COVID-19 are even more stretched. So we need to unlock a lot more private capital and there are systems out there for it. So moving ahead with an ASEAN taxonomy, putting in place unified approaches towards sustainable finance in terms of contracts and procedures and governments understanding that they will often need to provide the right guarantees for projects um, I think is an absolute must and then encouraging governments need to encourage companies in the region to move towards increased energy efficiency in their production lines in their energy usage at the same time and I think th those would be the, the biggest two asks for us 
and I think I'm within my three minutes. Thank you very much. And a very important key takeaway to unify the process is the key because uh, ASEAN, the beauty is diversity. But uh, when we want to achieve something, unified approach is very important. Thank you. And uh, so, um, Brian, uh, now, uh, please uh, don't charge, but I would like to hear your recommendations and uh, some key takeaways that you can uh, advise for the small and medium sized enterprise. And uh, how, um, how can they learn from the big one, uh, say, through your usual service uh, support uh, to them. So uh, particularly for SMEs, uh, maybe they would like to have some key takeaway. Thank you. Sure, thanks Joyce for having time for me for, to do some advertisement. So uh, actually, I, I, I think there's, there's cause in the, uh, here's most of the SMEs they will think uh, sustainability is something for big companies, but I think that there's, there's several things that they can do in terms of how how to make it happen within a business organization. The first one will be focusing on management rather than or initiatives. Because as mentioned, um, when we talk about going green or implementing sustainability, it's not, it's not about spending how much money on making some big initiatives. But if you have some, some kind of a management system in place, uh, have some behavioral change within your companies, all the roles and responsibilities on different sustainability matters are being defined clearly. I believe that SMEs can also do good on, on sustainability. So this is the first thing. So, second is you have to communicate to your stakeholders to demonstrate your leadership and business case. For example, if you're, you're suppliers of big, big brand or if you have some shareholders who, who concerns on your ESG, Communicate back to them. I mean, it's especially on the business case, but also the challenges you have. I mean, I mean, get, getting your stakeholders involved in the process and keep keep them in the loop on your on your effort is also really important to create a business case on uh, or how to how to make, make how to meet their expectation. And then the third one is more on how to how to really look at the return on investment in a quantifiable way because. Somehow, when we talk about going green, it's not, it's not, it's, the, the, the outcome cannot be seen in one to two years, maybe a longer term. So I think as a management, you need to, you need to have some kind, kind of evaluation, estimation, calculation on the ROI instead of, oh, okay, I spent one million, can, can I get back one million in one to two years? May not be, but, but maybe in, after the third or fourth years, you can get, get the money back or even earn more. So I think these are the, these are the major kind of, uh, change in the mindset that SMEs can do. But of course, from my perspective as a consultant, I think what we can support companies, how to, we can get the top management buy-in by demonstrating the business case, and also how to make all those uh, risks or, or kind of opportunities being quantifiable and measurable so that, I mean, in stakeholders can really understand. Thank you very much, Brian. And uh, I think in the accents, it's, it's very important. Engaging stakeholders and small business enterprise is always uh, having uh, difficulties in, uh, say, how to assess the ROI. So we do need uh, some professional third parties to, to support in the whole process. Thank you for the tips. And now, uh, Percy, um, I know you have been uh, leaders in your industry already, but still, I think uh, there are rooms for to excel uh, your performance in some ways or the other. Uh, would you like to suggest something that you think a government or professional bodies can support you better? I, 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 I assume IOO could be one of the parties uh, you can engage in the future in terms of the human resources part. <laughs> yeah, so uh, would you like <laughs> to uh, suggest uh, one important uh, thing or two uh, that um, we can make things better? Yeah, your, your expectation okay. from government or professional yeah, bodies or even civil society. Uh, I think it's, a, yeah, thank you for the question. I think uh, uh, the main point is uh, we can try to get some uh, government funding or local government funding, uh, like uh, especially uh, the scale of the project, uh, well, very similar to what Brian mentioned, a uh, lot in a big scale. But in that sense, uh, those uh, uh, small funding projects can help the company uh, to have the uh, initiative with uh, some money and resources uh, to work on that. Uh, I think uh, my company, GP Battery International, is an example very quickly. Uh, like the case of uh, from uh, HKPC, uh, Hong Kong Productivity Council, uh, they have a kind of a, a small project for uh, environmental leadership improvement. So uh, several uh, factories in uh, under our group uh, also apply for that. Uh, uh, already talking about over uh, 15 years, one five years. 
and uh, those are very successful project can help. Uh, in addition to that, uh, we can also uh, uh, contact to some of the institution, uh, like some of the environmental institution. Uh, those can also provide both uh, consultancy and support, uh, and also lot a very high pay uh, for for those uh, small scale project. So all those initiatives, I think, can help a lot for a uh, enterprise for an enterprise to proceed for that sustainability journey. Thank you, Percy. Very good suggestion. And I, I hope uh, uh, those uh, stakeholders can hear your voice uh, here through this platform. Thank you very much. And uh, so now, uh, Julian, back to you. Um, uh, so uh, do you think uh, there are any things uh, government or say uh, the civil society or stakeholders can do a better job to support you as well as your suppliers to do a better job to build a green supply chain and workplace? Absolutely. Uh, you know, Joyce, as you sort of mentioned at the start of the conference um, the forum, it clearly has a cascading effect. And, you know, if you look at the 17 uh, United Nations Development Goals, like you mentioned, that were launched in 2015, you know, they effectively drive social and environmental goals for over 100 countries, as, as you correctly pointed out. Uh, now, that obviously sets the national targets, which in turn influence business goals that become corporate responsibilities for our, many of our major retail clients and for our own business alike. Um, and we then, you know, uh, find ourselves, you know, implementing this into our own sustainable sourcing goals and, and practices. Of course, government uh, is also in a position to provide incentives, uh, you know, effectively economic opportunities to, to drive business in, in this direction. And quite frankly, they, they should. Um, that being said, plenty of businesses uh, like ours would be quick to latch on to new opportunities to build uh, sustainable and more green supply chains and to market them as a benefit to our clients and to end consumers. Uh, I mean, you, you mentioned training and I would say online training modules, videos and you know, other tools are, are very, very useful for business. Uh, we've built our own uh, social compliance procedures around the BSCI uh, manual uh, in the past, and we're looking to, into, you know, BEPI, for instance, uh, for how we can further address, you know, some of the 11 um, performance areas relating to sustainability that are contained in that program. Uh, I think in the future, it would really be good to have some widely accepted form of, you know, green audit, you know, with scoring systems that are, you know, able to be reviewed by brands and retailers to uh, promote genuine green supply options that perform well against the required sustainable criteria. Ideally, that's something I'd like to see, you know, taken up and promoted by industry. Thank you. I think uh, your request uh, echo what the other side of the supply chain when uh, Chris uh, mentioned unified approach in governmental say uh, policies. Uh, but here, when you implement, you also need unified uh, uh, standard uh, for audit. It also can ease many people's pain. Thank you for bringing that up. And Christina, uh, as usual, last but not least, uh, I would I would like to hear say um, any uh, key takeaways you would like to share with us before we proceed to Q and A session. Thank you, Joyce. Well, I think the key takeaway is uh, to emphasize the, the need for planning uh, for, for the just transition uh, to happening inside the firms, inside the, in, across value chains, and um, that goes across industry sectors as well. And this uh, need to, to plan, I think, have two, two very distinctive um, issues. One is the inspiration and resourcing that can come from, from comp at the firm level from company management. And that uh, inspiration, uh, the level of ambition uh, that we can see from firms here uh, is fundamental for, for everybody in, in the, inside the, the, the enterprise, for the workers as well to, to, to be inspired and innovate. And, and that innovation will pull uh, back into the, into the company in many other ways and into the stakeholder, um, shareholders as well. And the second aspect is uh, to have multidisciplinary teams inside uh, firms to make this planning happen. And we haven't talked too much about networks, but um, greening and 
on networks for greening uh, companies or for greening the firm or for greening uh, uh, the value chains, networks that include employees from different aspects. Um, they are all together uh, from different levels of management, uh, different teams, and bringing that together to, to specify some actions, climate actions for jobs, we would say. It's, uh, I think, um, um, a very um, good way to promote also decent work because provides like um, a thinking space, but also where actions are designed and then monitored. So I think uh, I will emphasize those two, two aspects for implementation. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, I'm uh, very impressed that uh, although we have some overrun, we managed to finish uh, two rounds of uh, sharing and discussion. Uh, and then we still have uh, a few minutes uh, to leave uh, rooms for uh, questions and answers. And uh, that's our all good takeaway. And uh, before uh, we end this session, I uh, just uh, I'm trying to read uh, the, the question sheet. And uh, this uh, comment uh, we received, uh, I may uh, share with you here. Um, it says here, enabling is not a question, but uh, worth to, um, uh, to, to share. Uh, enabling to real, really build a decent green, we need to clear up all the false marketing first. Uh, that is, hydropower is considered as renewable energy in which many or some people think it is good, but it is not good uh, for this uh, particular participant, uh, he, he or she, I, I'm not sure. And uh, it is not clean energy in his uh, or her opinion. And uh, so um, correct raising awareness is important. So this is one of the common uh, maybe um, uh, I just want to, on behalf of the audience, I just share here, uh, give a different voice and perspectives uh, while we are open to any uh, um, uh, 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 comments uh, from any uh, source of uh, our participants today. So um, now I would like to read uh, one uh, question. Uh, it says, uh, how to promote a pro-green workplace uh, I assume pro meaning, meaning professional. How to promote pro green workplace stroke community supply chain versus some um, uh, environment uh, which uh, have uh, some uh, maybe uh, authorities uh, supporting non clean energy projects that benefits them. So um, I think this is uh, maybe the challenge in the different uh, uh, economies or countries uh, might have. So. Um, May I invite uh, any comment uh, from uh, the uh, our panelists here? So um, maybe um, maybe I would uh, like because uh, it has not specified who should be the person to give answer. Uh, who would like to volunteer first I'll before first. I suggest? I'll go first, if you like. Yes, yes, please. Okay, yeah, it's a very good question, um, particularly in, in here in Southeast Asia. You got you have countries like Vietnam, the Philippines, or Indonesia have a lot of coal, um, which is therefore relatively cheap and easy for them um, to get out the ground. And as I mentioned earlier, they, they have an increasing energy demand, and building a coal-fired power station is relatively cheap. The technology is very easy. Uh, the rate of return for them is, is pretty high as well. Um, but the, so it does require a mindset shift, and I think a lot of that can be driven by industry. Industry, whether it's domestic or foreign in, invested industry in those countries, can be putting pressure on governments to say, we want cleaner energy supplies for our factories to enable us to meet the requirements of our consumers, of our, our business partners, of other governments in the world, of NGOs, and indeed of our local communities and, and our employees as well. So it's going to come a lot. Of, a lot of that is going to have to come from industry pulling governments along, um, but also equally, industry themselves can do a lot in this space. I mean, uh, it doesn't help. Factories use a lot of power, but doing simple things, showing you're doing things, so like putting in solar panels on your roofs and investing in your local communities and helping the communities green themselves at the same time. These are all steps in the right direction. But I think a lot of it's going to have to come from companies saying to governments, "You have got to help." clean up our supply chain and particularly our energy supply chain. 
Yeah, so that re it reiterate the importance of doing the advocacy work, which your council has been uh, trying to engage uh, people uh, and uh, uh, make uh, it clear to uh, uh, government and authorities uh, who can support uh, uh, in full speed. Thank you. Is there any other comment on this question? Uh, yes, uh, uh, Christina, please. Yes, it's a very, very good question and uh, also a good uh, answer by, um, by um, our colleagues. Chris. I Chris. think, um, yeah. by Chris, yes. Um, I think this is exactly what a just transition process uh, can do um, at the ground level. Because when we think about the industries that need to be green, and for example, uh, coal power stations, they are located in a particular community. Um, it's not the country uh, in total. It's a particular community, a particular area in many of the countries in Asia, rural areas with high level of poverty that has no other, no other um, source of livelihoods. So when we, we plan a, a, a just transition there, every part of the community needs to be involved so that we really engage with solutions but also with those that many times are left behind and i i should say here women many times are left behind on the planning process of uh, energy transition in a particular uh, region uh, because traditionally they are less involved in the and as workers, but they absorb the shock at the family level, and um, many times the restoration is coming from 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 women, the, the the women in the region. So that process where employers have a voice, workers have a voice, government have a voice, and the target groups like youth, women and other civic society also have a voice. That's the process of, of just transition. I think we are going to see a lot of these uh, planning processes around in the Asian countries as they move towards uh, um, a clean energy transition. Thank you. Thank you, Krishna, bringing a very different uh, perspective from uh, Chris just now, but I think uh, it end up at the same goal, uh, say engage uh, of the um, people in different areas and also um, women. Uh, this is a very key element that uh, uh, nowadays are becoming more uh, important. Uh, get them involved in the planning and uh, also can uh, act as a voice and to make uh, the voice heard uh, by the government and authorities to make uh, the policy uh, supportive. Um, uh, if uh, uh, if uh, there's no other views, uh, Brian, did you want to say something? If not, I have a second question. Maybe we can cover. Yeah. No. Okay. Uh, so uh, the second question is uh, interesting. Uh, I do have my personal opinion, but I would like to leave it to all of you to answer first. How does the companies in our panel, meaning all of us here, address problems of greenwashing in their supply chain, meaning our supply chain. Uh, okay, so um, who would like come first? Um, uh, because, uh, so I repeat the question, how does the companies in the panel address problems of greenwashing in their supply chain? Um, I think uh, by listening um, to all of you here today, you already mentioned Yes, we have already transformed in many ways uh, from the old uh, PR way of communicating green or environmental requirement into reality. Um, so, uh, but still maybe you have experience in facing this kind of uh, greenwashing when you deal with business partners, customers, or say uh, other stakeholders. Uh, how would you like to share your views in this um, um, uh, question? Anyone? Maybe I... Yeah. Uh, Percy, yeah, please. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah. Actually, I think uh, this is a very, very good question. Uh, according to the uh, marketing tool, a lot of companies just uh, 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 claim uh, a lot of uh, uh, environmental work they've done and, and achievement and so on. Uh, I think uh, the most important thing is that we need to utilize uh, some third party or an independent party for validation or verify uh, what the work uh, you have done 
in the sustainability area. So uh, similar to what I mentioned in my uh, previous uh, speech, I think uh, some of the important point is, uh, no matter what uh, force camp you want to make, or no matter how large you say uh, you have made a huge effort in uh, sustainability, uh, you need to do is uh, first quantify uh, what you have done, second uh, to validate uh, by a third party to know about your result i think uh, those will be the quite essential element uh, we consider in management point of view uh, and also the last thing is uh, don't uh, just similar to what brian mentioned before uh, don't just uh, use uh, the marketing guide uh, to promote or to work on the uh, sustainability work the actual work should be some expertise to do in the sustainability area Thank you, Percy. And uh, I would love uh, to share my uh, interaction, uh, 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 my experience in this topic. Uh, uh, Chris, do you want to say something? Uh, did I see you raise your hand? You know, yes. You, you did. I just want to follow up on, on what Percy was saying. And I think, you know, for someone like Brian working in this space, I could see an awful lot of work coming his way in, in, in the future. Because I think it's going to be increasingly important that businesses do or can show independent audit trails about how their supply chains are working going forward. We already know that Europe is looking at bringing in legislation about making sure that in your supply chain that there are no forced or slave labor issues and companies will need to do audits on their on their suppliers and then right down to the, the furthest, most distant supplier in the supply chain to make sure that is the case. And I think you're gonna see the same increasingly on, on the environmental side of life as well. So I can see a lot of work in the future for third party assessors and auditors in verifying what's going on in company supply chains, not just at their own factories, but uh, people who are supplying them. Yes, uh, thank you. And uh, allow me to also share my views. Uh, when 2015, when the 17 uh, uh, UN SDG goals uh, launched and many people and uh, immediately many brands or global companies set their target by when, by when they can achieve zero carbon. Uh, emission and then I talked to them and I said, how can you uh, make that commitment because uh, uh, you can easily make that commitment and finish tomorrow because your supply chain will close uh, because uh, your your goals need the, your supply chain partners to fulfill the requirement before you can claim your zero carbon emission. So um, and uh, like waste management, right? And then uh, say this is uh, uh, so the greenwashing actually uh, will end uh, by time, uh, in my opinion. Uh, due diligence uh, from all sides will prove that uh, who is greenwashing, who is doing a good job. Um, but of course, uh, with a panel like this, like a checkpoint is a good reminder. It is my pleasure to um, moderate this uh, panel. Allow me to also explain a little bit uh, why we are uh, actually the topic was suggested by myself when I talked to Freddie. Uh, uh, from uh, ILO, uh, uh, the RSP uh, uh, manager. Uh, I have been participating in this forum for a few years and I have been a speaker many times, but I certainly I'm not a green expert. But I would like to share, say the, um, the expectation from all sides is uh, high. And uh, we represent over 2,400 member companies who are banks, buyers and retailers who are committed to do a good job in sustainable supply chain, be it green workplace or green supply chains. However, we cannot do things on our own. I'm so glad that we have, uh, we are blessed to have all of you here. And I hope uh, this can enhance the interaction among all of us because the crossover interaction is important. Uh, we do have an initiative called Business Environmental Performance Init Initiative that composes 11 performance area. So uh, that kind of initiative, we are open to all of you to participate. If you want to know more, time is limited today. I cannot elaborate. However, I think we have lots of homework because uh, Chris has uh, published or say uh, produce many um, paper in advocacy, go to their website, join their webinars, yeah? And then I hope we can have uh, some new innovative uh, collaboration. And Brian, I know people will come to you anyway, and um, because you have a very good tools and uh, methodologies that can help not only the big one, but also small, medium size. Percy, please continue the journey. I We are happy to have you and I'm sorry, same as Julian, you act as the very unique voice on behalf of traders always forgotten by people. And last but not least, Christina, thank you for sharing all those resources with us and uh, all the good plan framework you set up. I hope people can have higher awareness and uh, access right to your tools, because uh, I hope through this platform, we can continue our collaboration with your green job team. 
And uh, now we have one minute left and uh, allow me to thank you once again for your participation. I don't know how many people are listening, but definitely people can hear the recording of today's story. Please uh, cascade uh, the result and uh, good take away from the panel. And uh, it, this is only a checkpoint. So I hope uh, we can see each other soon in different forums. Uh, we have many other programs uh, uh, prepared by the organizers. Thank you very much. Offering and Fori have the chance uh, to moderate today. And uh, I think that's just in time, 11.30 and 10.30 in Bangkok time. Thank you very much. And allow me to take a picture uh, with all of you. One, two, three, cheers. Okay, thank you. And uh...